Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Joseph. Thanks, Dan. Um, you spoke about vitality in a certain way. I'll try and talk about it in another way, see if it connects. I think it does. Um, about 20 years ago, I did a project which actually tried to do a sort of system of how you measure vitality. And the key thing was that we were saying it had to be integrated. So if you're looking at the vitality of a place, a street, a neighborhood, a city, You'd have to look at economic vitality, social vitality, cultural vitality, all the vitalities coming together in some sort of sense. And the danger with a lot of talk about vitality today is people think it's just a few coffee bars and things like that, which is a slightly narrow definition, but we don't need to go there because you, you know all that. Um, what I find quite interesting, though, is to look at the notion of vitality and the viability of places in the context of the fact that the world is a smaller place, that people are moving out, it's a nomadic world in some sense, people are leaving, uh, others are coming back, but perhaps they're not coming back, and that's the problem for, the most, for most cities, since a series of cities, London is obviously one, uh, have the sort of vortex effect. Uh, which sort of drowns and drains often potential from other places. And so it's often these other places uh, that are suffering. Um, so that's the issue, really. Are they coming back? We know they're leaving, but they're leaving and going more normally to certain hubs. And what this is all about, obviously, is that certain places, if you look at the global dynamics of cities, I'm ensnarled here in the global dynamics, um, is they're all trying to increase their, 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 their footprint and their resonance and the capacity to draw attractive uh, attraction to it. So the question is, what is vitality in that context? Um, now, this is a quite interesting. I saw this in Zurich, and it's the street which has been eradicated in all the... Uh, the Amazons and all of that, or I, know, I was about to say, it's Uri West anyway, all that street where all those new companies are. And there's a hotel at the end, as you can see, which is the Renaissance Hotel, and one building is left. And this building, an artist put resistance. And in a sense, this image encapsulates actually the totality of what I think urban development is about, because of course it's always by definition contentious in one way or another, because it obviously involves change. Um, and so therefore it comes back to that question of fragility and the issue in cities, which is obviously the question between the complicated and the complex. A lot of the things that we've looked at historically have treated cities as if they're just complicated entities, rather logical, linear, and so on. Whereas, obviously, because people are involved, it's iterative and then complex, unpredictable, i.e. the difference between going to the moon, which is complicated, and bringing up a child, which is complex. Um, and therefore, one of the things I think have happened since we did that initial vitality work is that you can see much more clearly that the stages that we've gone through in the context of this is the massive retrofitting of urban infrastructure in most of the places we're talking about in order to make it uh, more a place where you have proximity to networks and connections, i.e. the sort of cities we're talking about and you showed images of, as distinct from the city, the more industrial city, that had proximity to resources. So that sort of infrastructure is obviously changing and what we're seeing and what you were talking about is in a sense trying to make it a sort of sensory experience in some sort of sense. Nevertheless, you live with the legacy of this. I was here for about eight weeks and it was a very pleasant experience living there. But there is a city just over that uh, walkway there, uh, which is Perth, Australia. And therefore, you can see that shift. This is Adelaide Airport, which is trying to sort of respond to, to the shifting way we perceive and wish to experience cities. And you can see this, obviously, in the new Museum Branly here, where they're putting a hydroponic building, and there's an old icon, a new icon, a different way of looking at, at things that are making a mark. But one of the key things that really happened, I think, 30 years ago, 
with the new uh, push towards globalization was the, 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 the question of who am I, what am I as a city? Um, I mean, I'm saying distinctiveness here. And that really brings in the cultural dimension. And that, of course, is the other invisible hand of city making, historically always seen as a thing that is the afterthought, whereas I have a, well, anyway, I basically think it's the core through which then all of our decision making is ultimately made. And that other invisible hand, that DNA of city making, uh, can be good and bad. If that city is open-minded, certain things can happen. If it's closed-minded, other things happen in it or don't happen. But of course, it's a thing that, as it says here in this graffiti in, in Tel Aviv, it's not really that thinking is not part of the operating system when you're looking at your classic company that is either, I'm sure Arabs is different, but I mean many of the others are really just using this at stuff as an afterthought. And this is really the issue, of, you, know, you know there are obviously 32,000 McDonald's and I once did a calculation that if you added all the McDonald's and all the subways together, the, the length, you could go from New York to Los Angeles just as a sort of speculation, uh, just to remind myself of the dreary sameness of things. And then I looked at Venice and we know Venice is quite an interesting place and uh, this is Naomi Campbell in Venice and so that's the real Venice and this is also the real Venice but it's basically an advert now and this is a copy of Venice in Las Vegas and then I went to Macau and this is a copy of a copy of Venice in Macau and then I went onto the third floor and the Grand Canal was in Macau but with lots of shops like Zara even and which are not so fancy really but obviously Bulgari, Prada and all that sort of stuff and so then I went back to Venice and went to the station in Venice. And I think you will recognize this. This is a copy of a copy of a copy of Venice. And then I went to Lyon and saw another copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of Venice. All I'm really trying to say is that this branding and the globalization is doing a series of things. So this is Soho, we know south of Houston Street. And I've been collecting pictures of Soho. These are English Soho's here. Lots of cafes and bars and so on. And then Zaha Hadid obviously has to go to a different level. This is Soho Galaxy, which of course is in uh, Beijing. Um, and so it goes on. Um, but then I thought, well, hey, how can we make history and creativity great partners? And this is Kosice in Slovakia, the second biggest city. And people were asked, uh, do you want the buildings that we destroyed that were originally here before we put these department blocks on the top of your apartment? They were all surveyed in a public consultation. <laughs> Everybody said no, apart from this building here, which is now uh, one of the most popular buildings in Kosice. So what I'm really talking about, you know what I'm talking about. Now here's another example in Tainan which is again about public consultation. Someone wanted to build a road, Tainan, near Kaohsiung in Taiwan, and they knocked half of it down, but they only had sliced through half the building. So one of the largest artworks in Asia is the half buildings on this boulevard that have all been sliced, which now has become, of course, the most popular area in this city um, because it's effectively a version of I can make it here, I can be a maker, co-creator, shaper of an evolving place. So there's lots of copying as we know, and this of course is the Chicago theme, which is copied everywhere. This, I think your guess, is Athens because the cow is reading the Financial Times. Um, so all of that is essentially about who, what a place is, its intrinsic core, its essence, call it soul if you like. And the other big theme that emerged in all of this thinking through in the last 30 years is from then the city of culture to the city of knowledge, because what this was all about is generating a platform through which the city can then harness the collective imagination, which might be in its, in its people, in its university institutions, and so on. And that is all, of course, also about the diversity of places and bringing those differences together into one sort of entity. 
And now I would say that when you're looking at, again, it from the helicopter point of view, people have said the city of culture, the city of knowledge, the city of opportunity, and have therefore created platforms, um, which is essentially about the startup culture. And, and Dan will recognize where this is. This is in Alto University uh, in Finland, Helsinki, Espo. Um, so now just a bit about another way of saying that same story. So because a lot of what I'm doing is always trying to simplify, so I apologize if I'm being simplistic, uh, one way of looking at the world is to say, well, OK, every city has its history. That's 0, 0.0. This happens to be uh, near Lyon in Villeurbanne. Um, so there's a version in London. But the 1.0 city is really the hardware-driven city, the city which is thought about in terms of, as they say in Australia, roads, rates, and rubbish, really hardware thinking, which uh, lacks some sort of sense of, of an emotional way of looking at cities, given that cities are primarily an emotional experience, not an experience in theory of concrete. Now, that doesn't mean I don't like engineering. Of course, I love engineering. Things have got to stand up, uh, and lifts have got to work, and so on. But that 1.0 city is very, sort of has a certain view of technology. It has a view of planning, which is a bit top down, a view of an economy, economics, which might be the factory. Associated with that is a sort of culture 1.0, which is a bit sort of like you have your monuments, you have your containers, but you don't necessarily think of the content. This is in Lisbon. <coughs> if they had used that money to put it into an endowment fund, they would be funding creativity forever. Yeah? But this building is essentially always empty. If you go to Japan, everywhere around the world, you see empty buildings, which are containers without contents. Usually, these places in this 1.0 have red, I don't know why, red, red public art. And I've been doing a, an official survey, and 62% of public art in the world, this is purely scientific, is red. Um, now, I know red is, you know, it's got something about it, but why so much red? Um, so various people have said, we need to think about this differently. This is Athens, it's saying wake up for different reasons, by the way. And what they've said, there must be a different way. And Dan, by the way, this is in Ghent, so perhaps you passed this planning consultancy. Um, and what they've really said, what I would call is as a different city. Let's call it 2.0, which I would call soft urbanism. And by soft urbanism, I mean is where the soft and hard thinking is legitimized simultaneously. Easy to say, difficult to do, because in a sense, who is in charge is so often not necessarily those who know the soft. And one of my main revelations in all my life has been it's a five words, and it took me 35 years to work it out, which is the soft is the hard. But the soft in city making really doesn't have enough legitimacy and so on. And so this question of the senses, the sensory experience, which partly through digitization might change how we see and experience cities, might provide different ways of meeting, talking, living, navigating in the city, exchanging in the city, which of course is the essence of why cities are there in the first place. So in that more soft urbanistic approach, planning becomes a bit more consultative, it shifts and changes, but there's also, this is Dubai of course, the sort of spectacularization of infrastructure but again, I know I think some Dubai things are interesting, but it is very difficult, I think you'd agree, to walk around Dubai. Uh, you tend to have a meeting in a hotel and so on. Um, but that's part of the negative side. This is obviously the emergence then of smart city thinking. Other themes again emerge in that 2.0. But also in a sense, a, a thing where commerce and culture, this is Banksy taking the piss out of a thing in, in Bristol, um, where commerce and culture coalesce in a certain way for good and for bad. Much of it is very interesting, but the supreme artist of this, artist in the bigger sense, is Louis Vuitton, who then took uh, Yoyo Kusama and through the relationships they have with artists around the world to essentially sell more bags. 
And that season, 2013, was their biggest, most successful season ever, because what one was trying to do is obviously give meaning to things like bags and shoes. Um, so that's perhaps, I'm not saying completely negative, but that's the other element of that. The culture 2.0 aspect of that obviously takes on board the, uh, you know, the virtues of 1.0, but focuses more on obviously the creative economy. And this is the Nokia building in Helsinki, which reminds us of new ideas need uh, old buildings, Jane Jacobs saying. And here there are more people now working in this building than they did when Nokia was a, a cable uh, company. And what you find here, this is Rotterdam, is obviously masses of old buildings being reused. And partly what the resonance of this is, is the fact that in these buildings you feel you are making, shaping and creating them, and the pattern of ages is sort of shining through them. And of course the work settings, like here, are six companies. It looks like someone's living room, but these companies are interacting in sort of relatively cooperative ways. But then we're obvious, perhaps, I don't know, in a 3.0 city, which relates more to the conversations we've just had, which really connects to the here, there phenomenon. I'm here, I'm there, I'm doing two things at the same time. You're twittering, I can see that. You're on the phone, I've been watching you. Don't worry, I know you're paying attention. But it's where things like containers and things like that operate as offices. This is in Amsterdam and so on. Uh, and uh, the people obviously probably feel all right about it. I don't know what their sense of anchorage is, but that's a different point. And here it's obviously that world where more the notion that everybody can have an idea. It's the world where you dramatically retrofit things. This is the famous Chicago Millennium Square development, um, which turns one thing to the other. And the cars are still there, but they're underground. You have to be willing to pay the cost of that car park, where technology is more you can control it, even ultimately perhaps through your mind where spaces are made more intimate, and one can see that in the development of London in the last 20 years, and where planning in some sort of sense is integrated, more holistic, where the different departments work together and the sectors work together differently. And the cultural version of that is one where really one is more a maker of the culture. And this is obviously all the user-driven stuff that we've just already talking about and was alluded to in the former talks that we've just had. And perhaps TEDx is one of the main versions or things that we, we recognize in, in this approach. So that city 3.0, that culture 3.0, needs a different city and it needs to look different, feel differently, and its operating dynamics need to be completely different. Sorry, this is, uh, needs to be completely different. The management systems, which is why my latest project, I'm not talking about the creative city, but I'm talk certainly talking about the creative bureaucracy, which is my latest obsession, and the last time I will ever use the word creative. Um, so then, Recently, I'd been asked by some American organization to look at about 30 cities in Europe and to see why certain cities, even though they have the same assets as others, do better than one would expect, do better than other cities. What do they do? What are the qualities and characteristics? I won't talk much about it, but all I'll say is a couple of things. One of them is that these people have a sense of real tenacity. The people people in these cities. They have a sense that you can have foresight, that you can imagine, that you can and you know dare to dream, all of these phrases, these cliches that we know. There is a sense of courage. Courage was perhaps one of the main attributes we saw when we looked at places like the dramatic transformation of Malmo or Copenhagen that people forget was essentially bankrupt in, in 1993 and now as a model. These are people who are willing to change the rule systems and incentives regimes and willing to do some of the stuff you just talked about, which I thought was a great phrase about the code and so on. Can I borrow that phrase if I remember it? <laughs> um, 
But uh, so it's about rule changes. It's about new forms of consultation, communication, conversation. It's about the sort of things where how do you find ways of harnessing the collective imagination in a place? And it's ways also of thinking through how can you break the rich-poor divide? This is Malmo Western Harbour. You've got the classic icon, but you've also got in that, which is not immediately visible, quite a bit of social housing in that. And it's particularly what came across in all of that work was this ability to walk the talk. These are environmental plans for Paris. So it's just a way of showing there are quite a lot of them. So, but it's walking the talk. Now, finally, what I want to talk about, which I agreed with you, is just a couple of things. And this is an old phrase which we all know, the right to the city and responsibility for the city. And I've been trying to work through, just taking a helicopter view, what are the key things that this city that is seeking to evolve itself and come through, what are its characteristics? And I'm using this word civic urbanity because I, it sounds so old-fashioned and clumsy and hopefully won't become a slogan. Civic, worthy, 50-ish, urbanity sounds slightly cool. And the elements of that are quite simple. The cities which are really, I think, doing well and trying to do well have some sense that the shared commons, the invisible assets that are increasingly commodified, are valued. We know what they are. They are things where the public interest is more in the forefront. They're the things like here, this is Bryant Park in New York, Wi-Fi, all of these sort of things. So it's open to all and for everyone. Secondly, it's the seeing the city through the eyes of others and understanding, and we understand it, but there are threats to it, the diversity uh, uh, dividend. And I love this thing in Lisbon, the city of tolerance, which is one of the main sort of things in the main square. Uh, the third element is the inclusive imperative. We understand, of course, that if you build a city purely on the rich or on the poor, for that matter, uh, it really actually doesn't work. There is a codependency, which is actually quite dramatic when one looks through the, below the surface of, uh, of the city. So just making enclaves doesn't tend to make a city work, I would say. The fourth element in this is this question about intergenerational. I think with the commodification of so much, you get these things like, this is the pub only for 22 to 27 year olds, or 38 year olds to 46 year olds. And if you look again, there are so many things where the generations actually have things in common. They probably both like, for all I know, wine or whatever. I mean, that's a trivial example. But that intergenerational thing, I don't think should be forgotten. And some of these things I'm saying are completely obvious you know, eco-awareness and so on, sort of bringing in holistic accounting, all of which exists in theory. It's struggling to get out, but so many places are resisting. And as you probably know, this is obviously Venice. This is not, this is not Photoshop. The sixth element is only really a word change. Healthy urban planning. Planning that by definition tries to make you healthy rather than ill. And I saw this in America recently, and it said National Walking Day, and I sort of thought, hey, this is fantastic. National Walking Day. And then, just one moment later, I turned round. So that's what they considered National Walking Day, which was selling you machines to walk because the city itself wasn't walkable, and then therefore I don't need to say more about issues of obesity and so on. And that also has a mental dimension, because here is a courthouse. There's another courthouse, which I'm not showing you, which has a blank wall, which says you are guilty before you're proved innocent. But here is, again, Adelaide. I'm just using this as an example. And as you go up here, there's, all, there's a gallery of art. It just goes art, 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 before you get into the courthouse and are punished, which is a different experience of, in a sense, uh, encountering the criminal justice system. And then there's the aesthetic responsibility. And I really love asking developers, what are you building today's heritage? Uh, sorry, whatever you're building today, is that tomorrow's heritage? Or are you building something that will stand the test of time? 
And this is a building, which I'm sorry to keep on referring to Dan, but because I have con strong connections with Helsinki, he will know this building. And this building is the most loved and most hated building in Helsinki. And there's a very simple reason, because it's Alvar Aalto, who is obviously the god, uh, a, a god there. But it doesn't matter, because at least there is a discussion about the aesthetics in a way that brings often old-fashioned words in which are okay. Like, is it beautiful? Is it ugly? I mean, ugliness should be much more in our urban vocabulary, i.e. avoiding it. And then, perhaps, oh, that's the sound system. Then we're back to something I've talked about in the past and I don't want to, which is really the notion of creative city-making, which at its core, in one sentence, a 300-page book, is it's an empowering ethos which is about creating the conditions in a world of dramatic change which allow people to think, plan, and act with imagination and to discover the hidden resources that come from lateral thinking, that come from being open-minded, that, that being relaxed about uh, ambiguity proffers you. And then finally, this is my last sentence, all of this only works, which is why I'm so obsessed by bureaucracies, is a reinvented democracy which rethinks the rules system. And I've just been at an event where 16 or so of rule breakers from the round the world were, including the parking day, John Bella, uh, who, who did the first time, went to a parking thing and put a coin in and said, and the guy came up and said, what are you doing? <laughs> You're not allowed to just have this for choice. He said, I booked it. I put the coins in. And he says, this is for a car. He said, no, 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 I'm going to put a bed here. Because he'd booked it for two hours. So that is really about shifting things from here, this area here, which we can discuss later, to here. And I can assure you, those few places that base things on principles and intent find it much easier to be agile and responsive in the way that you're requiring than... The, the, than others. Now all of this requires a vast change in trust between sectors, departments and things like that. And that's all I'm going to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.